You're listening to the Match Mary Mate Show, where we aim to be the number one relationship education podcast for Black women and couples in the country. As I teach you how to get your love lives together. Here I guide you on your dating and relationship journey, empower you to honor yourself and own your truth, teach you how to navigate and negotiate your needs and desires with men. I'm your host, your girl, Joyce Robinson Myers. Welcome, love buds. I'm here with the seventh episode of season four titled Springing into Womanhood. All season long, We've been discussing topics to teach about various stages in womanhood and ways of approaching singleness, relationships, and marriage, while focusing on the fourth energy center of the body, which is hearts, representing love, right? Love for ourselves, for others, as well as awareness and insights. You're listening to episode number 27, Mother Daughter Lessons. Let's begin with the power of affirmation. We start every episode with an affirmation as a way to center self, listen to the body, and honor our spirit. Ask yourself, how are you today? What moods, feelings, or emotions come up? Use that energy to speak life, wholeness and healing over yourself using the power of your own voice. Speak it into existence with an I or I love. I love my mama. I love my mother-daughter talks. I love learning more about my mother and myself as women. Today's episode is inspired by the Match Mary Mate listening audience and clientele. You all have been asking me since about 2022 to create some content with my mother and I, and today is your magical day. Plus, speak a lot about mother-daughter relationships, namely on my blog and IG Live, so it's only fitting that I share a small glimpse of me and my mama's relationship dynamic too. Now, this was my best effort to take the spice level down a notch between her and I, but mainly her, y'all, because my mama is a whole something else as much as I could for us to produce this show together. It wasn't easy. My mama comes with that in-your-face reality, and then it stirs me up to co-sign with her, and I'm sure that the interwebs is ready for all of that, but I did my best to give you a mother-daughter conversation that I believe you will be blessed by. So what's going on today? My mother teaches us a storied lesson about testing the authenticity of men. And while you get the abridged version, I must give her her props here because the extended lessons that I've received have helped to save my life from real danger. I share more about that encounter in special episode number one, if you're interested. It certainly taught me that assessing authenticity is not just a one-time deal. I asked my mom to explain two Marie-isms that we're all so fond of, and she gives a little backstory with some bedroom activity tea too. I told y'all she can get spicy, but again, we have kept it PG for our audience. And then she shares a lesson in womanhood and the impact of our feminine wisdom. While I add one way that that lesson manifested in my life by her way of teaching. And last, she closes with one lesson girl moms should be sure to teach their daughters. If you want to write into the show with a dating relationship or marriage story or question that you'd like me to respond to, please use the link in the show notes to submit it. Or you can email me at podcast at matchmarymate.com. If you want to chat with me about it first and you're willing for parts of that session to appear as an anonymous secret story on the Match Mary Mate podcast, you can book a discounted call under awareness plus secret story for over a hundred bucks off. Again, see the link in the show notes for more details. 
Now I'm earning my PhD, studying the science of love and social connection to place myself in the best position to support my community. Studies show, and I believe, that with proper relationship education, we can produce smarter, safer, and happier romantic decisions that improves the quality of our relationships as we match, marry, and mate. Because why, y'all? Black love matters, and we're in much need of some Black family restoration. I realized I could have both mother and daughters listening today, and some of you are both. I also understand that while this day is a day of celebration for me on both ends, that it may not be for someone listening, and I want to honor that. So this show is lighthearted fun and connection between a mother and her daughter, but in its close, so the journal segment, I share a heartfelt message to daughters who have rocky relationships with their mothers or who have lost their mother. And I also do that with mothers who have lost a child or children or who are hoping to have their own one day. That part of the show could get a bit emotional, so I wanted to warn you. But I also believe that on a day like today, that kind of emotion is okay and often needed to process and escape your body. We need our mothers, it's only natural. And for those of us who have given birth, we most certainly need our children too. I think you all know by now that I don't hold a Christian worldview, but I do maintain a biblical perspective. And I am heavy on the literature and wisdom-based books, as you'll hear in today's episode. And my favorite is Proverbs. The book of Proverbs begins, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Not only was Solomon a king, but the son of a king too. And we know that kings are famous, sovereign, and supreme in all the land. So for Solomon, people bowed in his presence. They followed his command. They respected his authority. What does that mean in regards to his relationship with his mother? Now, there's Israelite drama between his parents, for sure. And his mother, Bathsheba, had married his father, David, under some undesired circumstances, even events displeasing to the Most High. Still, she was his mother. And we learn in 1 Kings 2 and 19 that when she went to speak to him, King Solomon, her son arose to meet her, bowed before her, and sat on his throne. Then he had a throne set for her as his mother, and she sat on his right side. She was his mother, and even kings bow when their mothers enter the room. In Proverbs, Solomon writes, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. We learn that a mother is a teacher. He also says those instructions and teachings are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. While I know some mothers do not care for their children in a way that would create such honor, I still believe in a degree of respect, even if just for the DNA inheritance. So I will give my mother her due anytime I have the chance, including today on this show. My mother has been a teacher to me and my brothers, and we do well to listen to her wisdom and adorn ourselves in it like King Solomon advised. So I want to dedicate this show to my late baby brother. Keep resting, Joshua. Our mother really misses you. Okay, mom, one of the things that my clients or even just women who want to work with me say often is, oh my gosh, you were so, you were mothered so well. How does she know to give you all these things? Or I would love for your mom to be able to teach us a lesson or two. So ladies, here's your chance. I am in the studio live and in the flesh with my mother, and she is going to give you a lesson or two. Okay. So one of the lessons that I taught you when you were growing up 
was to do what I refer to as the sweet pea test. Um, the sweet pea test basically means that you are trying to discover how authentic is someone because people talk, you know, talk is cheap. People present you with words and where the words can make you feel good or kind of, you know, give you a hopeful um, future or how something could play out in the future, it doesn't necessarily mean that the words are what, authentic enough or it's actually going to materialize what is being said. But the sweet pea test kind of helps you to develop or understand what are people's authentic intentions because the sweet pea test is there to reveal behavior. Truth is actually revealed in a person's behavior and not necessarily in their words. So, of course, when you first meet someone, what are they giving you? They're presenting you with words. They're presenting you with stories. And we take that a lot of times to mean what are their intentions and therefore, again, how they could possibly behave in a future scenario or situation or relationship with your with yourself. And the sweet pea test helps to reveal those behavior or behavioral people. It comes from a very old school nursery rhyme back in the day. In the castle, there lived a queen and a prince. Well, there was a storm one night and there was a young lady who was an actual princess that got lost in the woods because of the storm. She came upon the castle, knocked on the door. And of course, they, the prince, I'm sorry, the prince and the queen let her in for shelter. The prince fell madly in love, but the queen refused to let the prince marry the princess because she had to be an authentic princess. And the queen did not believe that she was a prince. The way the queen was going to test to see if the princess was an authentic princess was to um, put a pea under her mattress because in that time, their folktale was that a princess could not sleep on an actual pea. So the queen decided that she was going to, you know, kind of stack things in her favor. So, of course, the princess went to sleep on the stack of mattresses. And um, because she slept through the night, the next day when they woke up, the queen was trying to convince her son that she was not an authentic princess and therefore he could not marry her. So the moral of that story is do not judge others based on their appearances. OK, and so you're saying well, we're not going to judge them based on the appearance. We're going to judge them essentially based on this demonstration of character and behavior, more deeds, not words. How should a woman go about doing that? I think that the way um, a woman in modern times can um, execute, if you will, the sweet pea test is by presenting what I refer to as ask to the man. So whenever a woman ask a man to do something, then um, that is a task or a behavioral action item for him. So if a man genuinely have interest in the woman, then he will accommodate her ask. Men who don't have a genuine interest in a woman, then usually he'll make an excuse not to perform the ask. So in my ask, I am actually the queen in the sweet pea test. And I put a little sweet pea, if you will, within the story um, or within my ask to see if he is willing to accommodate. That reminds me of one of your famous or one of your infamous Marie-isms. Back in 2022, I think I did about 20 or 21 Marie-isms and the girlies had some top favorites, one of which is, if a man wants you, you'll know it. If he doesn't, you'll be confused. And so I kind of heard your retelling of that and your explanation as you have this ask, and if it is honored in some way, even if it has to be negotiated, but if it's honored in some way, you're on the path to some kind of authentic interest. And that gives more clarity. It's like, okay, I told him not to call me after 10 and he's honoring that. Or I told him as a woman, I prefer 
this reality or this scenario, whatever. And he has some willingness, some interest to make that happen for you or to honor it for you. And it brings so much clarity because it's saying this, not doing that, but doing this, but don't want to put the words on it. Just all of that hocus pocus <laughs> gives so much um, confusion. And I, I would say that particular Marieism has been true every single time. That one has never returned void to me. If if I'm like getting in there with the guy and he is interested in me, it's so clear. And if I got to be confused, I'm like, whoop, or you know what time it is. I guess I'm going to see myself out. <laughs> so I would love for you just to talk through that particular Marieism. Um, what made you come up with that? What? How has that been true in your life or in in some of the stories that you've used to kind of teach it to me or explain it to me? Growing up um, with a very much old school um, lesson that was taught to me when it came to relationships, if relationships back in the day had a natural progression. So you knew that if a guy asked you out, it meant something. If a guy kissed you good night, it meant something. If he asked you to go steady, again, it meant something. So again, this is the natural progression of old school dating. However, in more modern times, things are being said, things are being done, and they hold no value. They hold no weight. It's anything goes, kind of like throwing spaghetti to the wall, see what sticks. So when so when we started kind of making that transition in the dating world from old school style of dating to more modern style of dating, you know, you had a group of women that, of course, was caught up in this throw something again or throw spaghetti to the wall and see what sticks. So a lot of women were confused because we were transitioning from it used to mean something when you dated someone versus it means absolutely nothing. So anytime a woman is in a state of confusion with a man with regards to his intentions for dating or pursuing her, that means that he has no plan. He does not necessarily see this woman in, in, her, in his future. So he's not navigating the relationship to that final destination of, an, of exclusivity, of an engagement, of a marriage. So the woman will be sitting there trying to interpret what did he mean? What does this behavior mean? What does his words mean? Or she'll be sitting around with her group of girlfriends going, girl, he said this to me. What do you think that means? Again, you're in a state of confusion if you have to ask your girlfriends those type of questions. Or you have to ask your, those, those type of questions. Because the man should show up and tell you, hey, I'm interested. Hey, I love you. Hey, I see you in my future. Hey, I want to marry you. This is the man saying what his intentions are. But again, you will see his behavior navigate the relationship and the woman to, again, that the relationship final destination. So again, anytime you're sitting around going, oh, is he going to call me today? Is he not going to call me today? Are we going out on a date this weekend? He's just not that into you. There it is. There you <laughs> got it. You <laughs> came out, we went to go see it, and you were like, So remember that lesson I gave you? Yes, it could all be summed up as he's just, just not that into you. you. <laughs> <laughs> I use that sometimes in coaching, and my clients will be like, Well, dang, Joyce. I'm like, well, girl, he what you see from what you're telling me. You tell me if you see something different. <laughs> <laughs> what I would like for women to understand is that, first of all, a woman has to understand her worth. Now, usually what, what should happen is that we should get those lessons in our girlhood stage. We, should, of course, should have like our mothers, our aunties, more importantly, our grandmothers, helping us to understand the value or the worth of our womanhood while we're still in our girlhood. It should be in a maturation from girlhood to womanhood where the older women in your life is teaching you about the worth of being a woman. So what is that? The fact that 
She possesses the wisdom. We see the Bible speak of this. Women, wisdom is feminine energy. So that jewel of knowing something, seeing the insight of something, being intuitive is 100% the work of a woman. A woman can look into the future and tell the man what his future will look like based off what he is sharing with the woman current day. So when I was dating my husband, one of his guilty pleasures was that he enjoyed drinking Mountain Dews. So he drunk them morning, noon, and night. So, you know, I shared with him at that time, we were in our 20s. I said, hey, listen, you cannot consume Mountain Dews to this degree or it's going to cause health issues for you later. Lo and behold, about 30 years later, he died due to complications with his health as a result of over-consuming Mountain Dews. This was just my womanly wisdom, my female intuition. The wisdom of a woman is her superpower. Growing up, I remember having to study Psalm and Proverbs, literature books often thought to be personified in the feminine to communicate a degree of wisdom or understanding. My brothers got more of the Psalm training, I think because there was just so much in there about the instruction of a mother specifically to a son. But I had to spend more time in Proverbs again with that female wisdom. So the story that you're telling about my father reminds me of Proverbs 4, 6, and 7. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. (laughs) I guess my daddy didn't do that. Well, you know, there's consequences as well as reward in this scripture. So I think about Female wisdom, I would say female wisdom and intuition are pretty synonymous. There's this emotional and spiritual intelligence that animates life, right? It gives the capacity to cultivate this inner life. Um, Denzel Washington speaks about this often in regard to his own marriage and his own wife, the reason he's been successful. Yes, it's been her, her presence and her hand in his life, but he often talks about how his faith and his spirituality has been developed based on hers, based on a degree of wisdom um, that she has been able to embody and he has, I guess, partaken in and in some ways um, borrowed from to, to make his own. I'm also thinking about, I think it's Proverbs 8, With Lady Wisdom, it's a literary personification, but nonetheless, there's a connection there between the Most High's wisdom and Lady Wisdom or this feminine wisdom. If I'm not mistaken, Proverbs 14, I don't want to misquote the verse, but somewhere in Proverbs 14, it talks about a wise woman building her home developing your feminine intuition muscle and allowing it to develop, grow stronger, mature, and evolve throughout female life can start in a variety of ways. But there's this idea of filling yourself up. One of my favorite passages in scripture is Naomi and Ruth. And one of the things that I admire so much about the feminine essence that was Naomi was her refusal to die empty. And she's not the only female character in the Bible that has this kind of like motivating drive. I think in some ways, all women do this need to fill yourself up this resistance or this rejection of emptiness. We tend to not want empty lives, empty love, empty wombs, empty homes. Something about 
this state of emptiness is like the antithesis of female identity. We very much thrive off of fulfillment, satisfaction, contentment, just things being filled. And so Naomi was like, listen, if I have to leave this town and go back home, what I'm not going to do is die empty or die barren. That is a, a biblical word we see often where these women would cry out to the most high in prayer, in sorrow, just fill me up. In this case, fill up my womb. They didn't want to have empty legacies, empty names, empty homes, empty wombs. For me, both as a child and also as an adult for my personal self and then teaching other women, I see feminine intuition, feminine wisdom, its entry point as filling yourself up. For me personally, I was taught to fill myself up with wisdom literature. It wasn't limited to the scriptures, but that took up a lot of uh, space. So your Proverbs, your Psalms, your Song of Solomon, those feminine-based literature, starting there and filling yourself up with it because it starts to give you a spirit of wisdom. It starts to give you female identity and you attach to it because you, you feel it as familiar. You feel it as something that you desire, that you can do, that you can pull off. And in doing so, it brings you a degree of contentment, a degree of, degree of satisfaction, kind of feeling up that inner woman and uh, rejecting an emptiness. And then as it is poured into you, you begin to exude it, embody it, become it, practice it. And of course you find your own kind of like signature, your own je ne sais quoi, but you have to be kind of filled up on it first. It was excellent. Not my mama saying my summary of the feeling spirit of wisdom was excellent. Y'all cannot tell me nothing when I am full of my mother's praises. While I have you, let me tell you how much my feminine identity bundle will bless your life. You're already sitting here listening to the woman who poured into me and the foundation that I have to pour into you. You may as well get you some. The link is in the show notes. If you mention this podcast and your enrollment, I'll give you a complimentary 20-minute session with me for the first five ladies. So I can say for me, during my childhood, what I noticed about my grandmother when she was very on purpose with instilling wisdom in me. So I would say my first lessons in understanding wisdom or female intuition in my girlhood years from my grandmother were based on the fact that my grandmother wanted to make sure that I had um, life lessons from what she experienced in life so that I would not relive or have the same experiences in life that she had, that she thought were things that no woman should um, experience. So as I took that as my foundation, my foundational lessons or lessons learned, as I started entering into my womanhood, I then turned to the Bible or additional female learning. So what are some of those lessons from Nana? I think when I got to high school, eh, freshman, sophomore, somewhere up in there, you gave me this, I guess, nugget, wisdom nugget. And it just like follows this progression of how you can get what Usher calls caught up um, with a guy. So... You said to me, be careful who you talk to or let talk to you because the more you talk to someone or let them talk to you, the more you'll like them. And the more you like them, the more you'll love them. The more you love them, the greater the possibility of sleeping with them. And the more you sleep with them, the greater the possibility of 
carrying that seed or being pregnant with the seed, then you got real decisions to make. But at the time, you did not insert abortion. It was, and should that happen, you're going to be pregnant and have to deal with this man for the rest of your life. But whether you decide to terminate the pregnancy or continue it, you're still left with an impact that is lifelong for you. Obviously, there's a lot more weight <laughs> with choosing to, to raise up the child, but nonetheless, it will be there. And so there's a progression between talking or entertaining to like, to love, to sex, to potential pregnancy, and then the choice that a woman makes there. At that point, there is no coming back from it, not having lifelong effects. Again, whether you choose to terminate or to continue. So when I say that to women, they're like, girl, who told you that? And how? How did the person know that? Because yes, that is the progression. Many of them saying, I didn't even like that little boy at first, or he got on my nerves or he whatever, but let him talk to me. And then he talked to me and he grew on me. And then we followed the progression out. So I know my clients and my listeners would love to have you talk that out a little bit. How did you come up with that? It just came out of my own life experience, right? So there were certain men that crossed my path that I was saying initially, absolutely not. You are a no. But they wouldn't take my no for an answer. And they just kept talking. They kept talking. After a while, I started to realize, wait, am I feeling this guy? And then I had to make a decision on, well, do I want to continue to try to feel this guy for things to continue? Or do I just want to say, you know, stand firm on my no and walk away? So um, with some of the guys, I stand, I stood firm on my no and I walked away. But there were other guys where I just kept listening and his words just started to sway me where I started to develop um, some interest. And then as a pseudo relationship developed, I soon realized that I should have just stuck fast to my no because this relationship cannot go anywhere. So from my own life lessons of having those experiences, I wanted to equip you with that information, with that wisdom, so that you could avoid having that same detrimental, I guess, relationship experience that I had. When I was in high school, I think I was about 16, there was a guy. Now he was fine. He was fine and he was sociable. Uh, he wasn't, you know, the greatest academic. But for what people are attracted to in high school, he was it. And I remember he walked up to my locker one time trying to holler. And I was like, mm -mm, I'm going to have to cut you off right there and not even let you finish that sentence. And he was like, what? So stunned. You could tell it was like the first time a girl had ever just was like not so enthused with his attention. And I quoted that. I was like, mm -mm, I got to be careful because and I went through the spiel and he thought that that was insane, but he respected it. He left me alone. And then, I don't know, maybe like five years later, maybe eight, 24, 25, something like that. I was at a party that was being hosted by someone I went to high school with, and he showed up. Nothing had changed in his life except he had added a bunch of children. And he walked up to me, and he was like, remember what you said to me at the lockers back in high school? I was like, I think so. He was like, yeah, you gave me this story about you can't even talk to me. And then when he said that immediately, I was like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And he was like, I just wanted to tell you your mom was right. Because I ain't ish. <laughs> that was the first time that I had a guy come back and say, you made the right choice then because I really wasn't on anything. But you would say romance in the stone, but I don't even think a 16-year-old knows how to do that. So maybe uh, he wasn't about anything, but just probably sex or the attention, being able to say, yeah, 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 so-and-so's talking to me, so-and-so's talking to me, and not about anything of substance. And so I dodged that bullet because there are a couple of girls in high school 
who got that man baby. Then you have another Marieism where if he can't dance, <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you finish that line. But it was taught to me um, how to look at how men dance, their their approach to dancing, the willingness to dance, and then obviously the quality of it to determine other things. Do tell. So yeah, so my expression is if a man can't dance, of course, that pretty much means he can't get down with the tool in his pants. So um, ladies, let's just be real and grown for a second. We all know that when it comes to bedroom activity between a man and a woman that, you know, the man must have some type of rhythmicity in his stroke, in his movement, in order for it to be really pleasurable. Now, some other things, of course, plays into that for it to be fully pleasurable for the woman. So how do you determine if a man has good rhythm in order to give you a good stroke experience? Lord, the best way to tell that is see how he moves on the dance floor. So do we expect every man to know how to dance, like dance, dance. Not necessarily. If a man knows how to just two-step, that's an indicator that, okay, all right, you probably have some good rhythmicity. But if he really knows how to dance, you know, he got a whole bunch of dance moves, that's also an even better indicator that he probably has some good rhythmicity to give you a good stroke in the bedroom. Ladies, we can talk about all of this and more in group coaching. We can be more unleashed and unprohibited in a sacred space for women to talk about the facets of female life that only really need to be known by us. So I invite you to sign up for a coaching cohort at coachjoyce.com. If you want to meet in a group once per month, choose Philia Love Lady 1. Or in a group twice per month, choose Philia Love Lady 2. And if you want something a little more chill, choose Agape Love Lady for monthly mentorship. So again, if he can dance on his two feet vertically, he can probably dance quite well oh horizontally. <laughs> yeah. And if he can't dance, ladies, you probably want to think Again, about giving him an opportunity to show you what he is made of in the bedroom. I think that helps us slide right into how to have the conversation. You've said this in a variety of ways across the years, but probably the most hilarious moment. You had a friend. <laughs> Lord, I hope she is not able to identify herself if she ever <laughs> But you had a friend and you were like, this chick just, she told me she took off all her clothes and just jumped into the bed. She just got naked and jumped under the cover. <laughs> Do you know who I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and you used that whole scene to be like, uh-uh, let me tell you the conversation you should be having with a guy and how this experience should be because... No, we're not going to be around here just derobing ourselves and jumping under the covers and hoping for the best. So, you know, don't tell details to expose someone's identity, but give us the story and give us the lesson. We were just having girl talk one day and um, I was explaining to her what I expect in the bedroom from a guy. And so she responded back by saying exactly what you just shared. But of course, part of how we were ended up having that girl talk is because she was explaining how she was not having the most pleasurable moment in the bedroom with guys. And so I was, you know, kind of probing her with questions like, so you don't have what I refer to as the sex talk with the guy. She was like, what's that? <laughs> she <tricked it. laughs> What are you talking about? Well, no, you have to have the sex talk with the guy to get an understanding and an expectation of what's going to happen in the bedroom. Because although everybody or every other person has the equipment that is needed in order for you to have a bedroom activity, Everybody doesn't really know what to do once they get into the bedroom, right? Or they may not know how you particularly like it. So you have to have the conversation so that you can have the experience that you want to have. 
she said, and then I run like that. She didn't want to be seen naked. <laughs> well, girl, why are you even doing it if you didn't want to be? Exactly. Like, girl, you're supposed to do a little, hey, hey, now, now, what? You see me? Okay. This is what you're about to enjoy. So, um, yeah, she just really wasn't having what I would call the full experience. She was just waiting on the actual act to happen. Um, but even in that, some of the experiences that she was having, she was also was sharing with me that you know, he didn't know how to do this or he, the timing was off and da, 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 da. Again, have some conversations. Now, don't talk it to deaf ladies to the point where you're taking, you know, the fun and the mystery and the anticipation out of it. But again, you just kind of want to have a little bit of understanding of what you can expect when the two of you come together. As a girl mom, I know you're full of mother-daughter lessons, but for the sake of brevity on the podcast, as a girl mom, if you can just share one lesson, if nothing else, make sure you teach this lesson or this gym to your daughter. What would that be? Teach her to love herself. A woman that knows how to love herself will easily be able to identify love when it comes into her life whether that is love coming into her life from her girlfriends, her children, or even a man. But a woman who loves herself knows how to identify love, knows how to receive love, and also knows how to love back. All right, ladies, and that's on my mama. If you enjoyed today's show and would like to keep this podcast in production, consider making a donation. We thank you. end every episode with thought or heart provoking questions for your journal. Journaling is simply prayers on paper and the most high tends to those two. Dear listener, evaluate your relationship with your mother today. If you still have her, anything you need to share or want to get off your chest? If she was not what we tend to think about when we think of a quote unquote good mother, how are you caring for her maternal presence and energy in your life on this special day? If you have lost her, my condolences. I pray for peace and comfort over you during this time. As a mother, what lessons do you want to be sure to instill into your children? How's that going? If you have lost a child or are currently trying to conceive or preserve your right to have the option, my heart is with you today. I hope this day treats you kindly and warmly. Once in my life, I had to carry the burden of telling my mother that my brother was not going to make it. And I hope I never have to again. May today be well with you, no matter what kind of mother you had. And I pray your strength as a mother for any loss, gone, or hope for a child. It's okay to write about the blessings and the burdens Pour it out into your journal today. Release yourself, free yourself, and most of all, be yourself. Yes, no woman is better at being you than you. If you're interested in my research projects, my coaching work, or want me to speak about either at your next event, you can reach me at hello at matchmarymate.com. I hope you have some good food for thought after today's show. If you also want to share some topics that you'd like to hear in the future, please use the comments feature on this episode or shoot me an email at podcast at matchmarymate.com. Today, I leave you with an ancient proverb from King Solomon. Let her rejoice who gave birth to you. Thank you for joining me and tuning into another episode of the Match Mary Mate Show. Until our next time together, love, light, and relationship. Remember, we grow as we go. And I'll be with you in the next episode. Cheers.